Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Paul Carroll. I am the director of the Charity and Security Network, and I am very honored to be moderating this discussion today and I'm very privileged to be joined by people who have been really on the front lines of, of the lawfare world. Uh, I'm going to give folks just a minute to join the room. And just so that folks are aware, this is a public webinar. It is open to the public. And so the attendees are from a broad range of, of interests and organizations and backgrounds. In addition, we are recording this webinar. We will be posting the recording to our website when we're finished today. I see we're up to about 45 people or so. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right into things. Um, as I said, my name is Paul Carroll. I am the director of the Charity and Security Network. And the Charity and Security Network is honored to share with you our efforts to better understand, analyze, and identify how lawfare impacts legitimate civil society operations and the populations they support. Our report, The Alarming Rise of Lawfare to Suppress Civil Society, The Case of Palestine and Israel, does just that. In-depth research, painstaking verification of the sources, the relationships, and the impacts of lawfare attacks and lawsuits are described in the report, and recommendations about how to respond and mitigate to these impacts are offered. While the report examines lawfare in the Israeli-Palestinian context, that is only because it offers the most visible and well-documented arena. Make no mistake, lawfare attacks and abuses can and already are occurring in other contexts. The fundamental issues are the same, the risks they present are identical. These come in the form not only of lawsuits and legal actions, but also in reputational attacks and operational impacts. It's a core risk that civil society faces as authoritarianism grows, counterterrorism laws and policies remain fixed in a post 9-11 mindset and civil space is restricted. Today's discussion will dig deeper into these issues and we will hear from people who have been on the front lines of these battles. I'm privileged to introduce our speakers today. I'm gonna to introduce them quickly by, by their bios, and then I'm gonna hand things over to my colleague, Kay Gunane. Joining us today is Kay Gunane, the founder and former director of the Charity and Security Network. Ironically, when I was given bios for today, I wasn't given one for Kay. <laughs> I guess it was assumed I know her well, and I do. Um, she is a lawyer by training, but an activist by, by DNA and an advocate by DNA. And she founded the Charity and Security Network about a decade ago when she and others recognized the chilling effect and the restrictive effect that counterterrorism laws in the wake of 9-11 were having on humanitarian peace building and human rights organizations. Uh, I succeeded Kay in the director role about a year ago. She remains a senior advisor. And the lawfare report and research efforts were really her <clears throat> beast of burden over the last year and a half joined by colleagues with legal backgrounds and, and so on. This really was a team effort. So I wanna give a big shout out to Kay and she will walk us through the main findings of the report. We're also joined by Jeff Buckholz and talk about being on the front lines. Jeff is an attorney and a partner with King and Spalding, but really the reason he's joining us today is because during the Obama administration, he successfully defended politically motivated false claims act lawsuits against organizations like the Carter Center, Oxfam, Great Britain, and the New Israel Fund. Jeff served in the US Department of Justice in a number of senior roles, including acting assistant attorney general and principal deputy assistant attorney general for the civil division. And the civil division matters because that's where false claim act suits are, are litigated and handled. We also have with us today, Ahmed Abuzniad, who is the executive director of the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. He also founded after completing law school, a Florida organization called the Dream Defenders in response to the killing of Trayvon Martin. And while leading the Dream Defenders, he championed racial justice issues across the US and he successfully led several delegations of organizers from the US to Palestine. We're thrilled to be joined by Ahmed today. And then finally, we have Howard Horowitz, who runs a, an organization called Horowitz Research as a private sector entity become, and, and is known and, and researches a number of issues in Latinx, Black, and other historically marginalized consumers. 
But more to the point for today's discussion, he is the board chair of Westpac, the Westchester People's Action Coalition. Westpac is involved in a number of issues. They serve as a fiscal agent for organizations. Um, Howard has done a number of civil society actions in the Hudson Valley call to action. He has helped support uh, Syrian refugees in Westchester and Rockland and the Hudson Valley. He's also a founding member of the Iraqi Student Project in Westchester. He's also an active member of the Temple Israel of New Rochelle and serves on the social action and Israel action committees there. Um, the reason, I mean, there are many reasons why Howard joins us today, but Westpac was the target of uh, a lawfare attack challenging its charitable status. And so we're gonna hear more from him about that. So uh, the last thing I will mention is sort of the format and the housekeeping roles. Kay will give an overview of our report and walk us through some of the key findings and, and suggestions and recommendations. And then we will hear from each of the panelists for about five minutes. Uh, on their particular area of expertise. And then finally, we will go into a moderated Q&A. Now, we have quite a number of participants. The chat function is turned off. Um, the Q&A is where you should post your questions. And then we will have some assistance sort of running air traffic control to, to get those questions to me. Again, this is a public event and it will be recorded. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to my colleague, Kay Gunane. Take it away, Kay. All right, thank you, Paul. I have uh, to get, I'll get my PowerPoint shared. Uh, thank you all for your interest in this very important topic. It, it's one that has, not gotten the attention it deserves, which is one of the reasons that uh, CSN undertook this research and this uh, produced this report. Um, but after responding to the politically motivated attacks on nonprofits that work in Palestine, um, attacks that argue extreme interpretation of US counterterrorism law, um, CSN saw the need to centralize the information about the cases and the laws and political agendas behind them um, and put that together in a report that can serve as a reference to all interested stakeholders. I began with the idea of providing in-depth summaries of the lawsuits, regulatory campaign complaints and attempts to defund organizations to serve the basic needs of Palestinians. Um, actions that are brought by groups with political access to grind. But as the research progressed, it became clear there was a need to explain who these attack groups are and what factors have facilitated the growth of lawfare attacks. This includes the open collaboration and coordination of effort between the lawfare groups and the Israeli government. Um, it also includes the extensive use of disinformation and an overall political strategy of equating criticism of the Israeli government with anti-Semitism and discrimination. The result was a report that uh, is much longer than was originally envisioned and certainly too long to summarize in detail today. However, I will provide highlights and share some key observations uh, and recommendations. I gotta get this slide to move to the next one. First, the context. Uh, as Paul discussed, the global problem of shrinking civil society space is, is something that's been going on for some time and is uh, a larger phenomenon that the lawfare problem fits within. Um, also, the rise in authoritarianism over the last decade or more has helped fuel use of counterterrorism laws and national security restrictions for political purposes to suppress dissent, uh, to suppress political opposition. Um, and the post 9-11 legal framework that was created by the Patriot Act um, created restrictions that are so broad, they cover a broad array of civil society activities that are otherwise protected, uh, First Amendment, basic First Amendment activities uh, with rights of expression, association and assembly. Um, 
as well as activity that is protected by international humanitarian law and access to civilians in areas of armed conflict. Um, these restrictions were passed in a rush and in emergency situation immediately after 9-11, but over the past 20 years, they've become institutionalized uh, and, and continue to create problems for civil society. Um, what has, what has happened is that these factors are something that lawfare groups have been able to take advantage of and use, use to achieve their own political ends. So um, the report defines lawfare, uses the Wikipedia definition of lawfare because it best describes the situation that we find. The misuse of legal systems and principles against an enemy to damage, delegitimize them, uh, tie up their time, winning a public relations victory. Uh, that really is what is going on with the attacks here. Um, this is important to distinguish this from impact litigation, which uh, here I show a definition from the Washington College of Law at American University, which is uh, our lawsuits that take a rights-based approach to achieve a social change uh, that can affect a broad class of people and enforce basic human rights. This, what we're seeing here with lawfare is something that's very different. It has a political element that is more concerned with flipping damage on opponent and prevailing than with actually winning a case. And we've seen that in the way that the cases uh, described in the report have played out. So in the end here, despite the claims of lawfare groups that they're only seeking to hold nonprofits accountable, their actions are really about disruption uh, and harassment. The report identifies several factors that facilitate lawfare attacks um, in addition to the overall context of, of shrinking civil society space. And first and foremost, the vague and overly broad definition uh, of material support of terrorism in US law. Uh, it is something that is, uh, covers a wide range of, of not just uh, money and tangible goods or uh, equipment that could be used in attacks, but also uh, speech association and expressive activities, including um, training expert and advice and assistance for uh, peace building programs, uh, human rights protection and, and similar activities. Uh, this is combined with a strict liability standard in counter-terrorist financing laws in the U.S., and it essentially creates a zero-tolerance legal environment. Uh, minor violations can lead to stiff penalties, and, and this is a place, and because the law is so vague, it leaves substantial gray areas uh, open to interpretation, and this is where lawfare groups have stepped in with their own very extreme interpretations of what constitute material support of terrorism. And in many of the complaints that have been filed, the basic claim is that the groups being attacked have in some manner provided material support to Hamas or to the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, both of which are uh, designated forest terrorist organizations in the US. Then we've also seen uh, and a unusual development, the obscure IRS definition of what constitutes partisan electioneering by charities uh, is also something that enables regulatory attacks because like material support, it is very vague. Uh, the IRS uses what's called the facts and circumstances test, which means uh, the kind of, we know it when we see it, a sort of test that does not provide a lot of guidance to the regulated community about what does and does not constitute partisan electioneering, which is something that is prohibited for charitable entities in the US. So vague and overbroad laws and standards uh, are really at, very much at the heart of what's enabled these kind of attacks to go as far as they have. But in addition, uh, commercial database screening services that are used by banks or donors and others uh, when they're screening for compliance and doing their due diligence uh, to avoid terrorist financing, um, 
they use these commercial screening databases that will pop up a red flag when an organization has been mentioned in the news uh, or accused of some kind of association with terrorism. Um, but these services don't employ sufficient control to make sure that the results are credible and that has an effect on the organizations. And then finally, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. Um, it's also uh, very vague, but it's been used uh, to equate criticism of the actions of the Israeli government with anti-Semitism. Now, one, one thing the report does is go into some detail on profiling these lawfare and disinformation attack groups because we found there was no really good central resource of information about them. So uh, there is uh, in chapter three, an overview of these groups and then chapter eight uh, provides a detailed profile of each one of them and they're, they're listed here, the ones that are covered in the report. The Zionist Advocacy Center is one has brought False Claims Act. Uh, they get support from the International Legal Forum an Israeli-based uh, legal, legal think tank, legal action organization. Uh, and then other organizations are also involved in various types of attacks uh, with the Middle East Forum and NGO Monitor being key sources of both disinformation and uh, attacks on funding. But all of this uh, will probably would not have gone as far as it has without key support from the Israeli government. Uh, the Ministry for Strategic Affairs, now part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, has provided technical support and funding to these lawfare and disinformation groups. And here very quickly, I'm just sharing a copy to show the relationship um, between these groups and the Israeli government. The Zionist Advocacy Center has filed uh, under the Foreign Agent Registration Act as an, an agent of the International Legal Forum which uh, the Israeli-based organization, which in turn has worked closely with the Israeli government, uh, including getting funding and distributing grants. The lawfare attacks themselves uh, come in three major categories, litigation, complaints to charity regulators, and attacks on funding. The allegations generally uh, do not claim that money or uh, tangible goods have been provided to a group on the terrorist list. And this is, this is an important point because I think it speaks to the effectiveness of the due diligence and compliance that nonprofits engage in to avoid diversion of access to terrorism. Um, but instead they focus on speech and association, uh, the kinds of activities attacked in many of the complaints about democracy building, conflict resolution, human rights advocacy programs, as well as social service programs. Um, and then in reading the complaints, one will see that many of the allegations are conclusory. Uh, they lack uh, supportive detail. They make broad general accusations and sometimes include political harangues that will uh, accuse an organization of being anti-Israel without, uh, without providing uh, basically any evidence. I, and then oftentimes those, that's not the standard in the case anyway. Uh, it's, it's over the overall, the outcomes is that the lawfare groups have been losing these cases, but in bringing them uh, as far as they, they go, they do manage to impose costs. There are two types of lawsuits in the US, uh, a False Claims Act case, which you'll hear more about from Jeff, um, and the Anti-Terrorism Act case, uh, there are, there are one, there's been one of those. The False Claims Act is a whistleblower law that allows private citizens to file suits on behalf of the government. And what has happened here is that TZAC has argued that USAI grantees have falsely signed uh, the anti-terrorism certification when they get grants uh, and saying that they have not provided material support to terrorism. and then. TSEC goes on to argue its extreme interpretation of what actually constitutes material support. Um, the Anti-Terrorism Act, on the other hand, is a civil liability uh, statute that allows victims of international terrorism to file suits against the perpetrators of the attacks or those that have aided and abetted them. 
There's some interesting numbers. Uh, when we put the summary of all the cases together. We found uh, of the seven litigation cases that we reviewed, the damages sought over $600 million in, in damages sought in, in seven cases. The amount actually collected as a result of this litigation is under $3 million, only 4.5% of what was sought. Although uh, the Zionist Advocacy Center did collect um, nearly half a million dollars in statutory awards under the False Claim Act. The outcomes of the six cases filed um, and the, under the False Claims Act, two settled out of court where the defendants agreed to pay damages. These were the first two that became public. Um, one of them against Norwegian People's Aid uh, was settled because the organization didn't have sufficient contacts in the US to feel it could mount an effective defense. And it issued a statement on the settlement where it agreed to pay $2 million uh, to the US government. It made it, issued a statement that said they disagreed with the outcome, but they just didn't have the resources to fight the case in US courts. Um, three of the cases were dismissed. One of those has an appeal pending. And then one case was settled, uh, basically uh, called a draw. There was no omission of wrongdoing by the defendant and no damages paid. And then the Anti-Terrorism Act case, which you'll hear about, uh, was against the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, filed by the Jewish National Fund. It was dismissed in March of this year, but an appeal is pending. Regulatory complaints uh, have been filed in the U.S. and the U.K. seeking revocation of charitable status. And while to date uh, none have succeeded, as you can imagine, uh, these impose costs on the groups that are investigated, uh, they can have a chilling effect on activities and they give the law firm groups a hook to spread and repeat disinformation when they announce the filing uh, of these complaints. Um, many of them have been in the UK where there is a more open process of investigation by the Charity Commission there. In the US, uh, because of privacy laws, when complaints are filed, uh, the IRS doesn't have uh, an open process. And we know mostly about the US cases as a result of announcements from TZEC. And one, one of these that I think is a good example of the, the kind of spurious claims that are made, TZEC tried to get the Texas and status of Doctors Without Borders revoked because they provided medical training into hospitals in Gaza. And this was argued to be material support of terrorism because the Ministry of Health is part of the Hamas controlled government. And the last form uh, is a tax on funding. When lawfare and disinformation groups uh, advocate in the US Congress and European parliaments uh, to cut off foreign assistance funding to groups that work in Palestine or, or support Palestinian rights or partner with local civil society in Palestine. Uh, the Mis Israeli government also applies pressure to defund, including a 2018 report called the Money Trail, uh, where they alleged uh, millions of euros went to NGOs of terror, what they call terror ties uh, in Palestine. And there's a quote here you see from the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs saying that the allegations were unfounded, unacceptable, and based on vague and unsubstantiated accusations. So a few key observations um, for a uh, summarize the recommendations. The, the main observation I would make uh, is that pushing back works. Uh, it's impossible to totally prevent a lawfare attack. Anyone with the money to pay a filing fee in federal court could file a lawsuit claiming just about anything. That doesn't mean that they're going to win the lawsuit and pushing back against spurious lawsuits, it generally result, has favorable results. Uh, so that I would encourage any organization that um, feels that it is in danger of being sued for political reasons, uh, not to let that chill your activities because if there is, if there is an attack, a legal attack, it's something that you can deal with. 
A few more observations. Uh, lawfare takes advantage of policy gaps and vague laws, as I mentioned in the material support statute. It also incurs little risk for the attack groups. They can uh, bring uh, a uh, suit basically based on disinformation, uh, conducting smear campaigns, make outrageous claims, uh, but there's really no downside for them. It, it, they can still get the bad publicity for the groups that they are attacking, even if the lawsuit is ultimately dismissed. Um, the attacks tell us something about what the lawfare groups are trying to achieve here, because it makes you wonder. And looking at the fact patterns, there seems to be a fear of a united Palestinian front, the political front, and looking at the kinds of activities that have uh, given rise to lawsuits. They involve democracy building, education for youth, uh, building civil society, uh, helping uh, establish a democratic election process, uh, conflict resolution, peace talks, all those kinds of things seem to be uh, something that the lawfare groups have a problem with. Uh, and th also have, would like to cut off outside funding and support for Palestinians. The more uh, Palestinians can be isolated, then uh, the stronger that the extreme pro-Israel organizations groups um, have a, a more of an opportunity to achieve their, their political goals. And then last we've seen uh, some organizations have been uh, subject to lawfare suits, including Oxfam uh, and the Union of Agricultural Works Committee, uh, which uh, has been subject to uh, attacks on its funding, all work with Palestinian farmers, trying to help them uh, become self-sustaining and hang on to their land. And that seems, uh, there seems to be a motivation there that uh, helping those farmers stay on the land can interfere with settlement expansion, which has been deemed in illegal under international law. So that gets us to the recommendations. I won't read these all out, they're all in the report, but basically uh, the top line recommendations is when these attacks occur, government should address the factors that enable them, the vague and broad laws, for example, uh, change the definition of material support to uh, make it consistent with basic human rights and humanitarian law standards and provide uh, clarity and eliminate the vagueness that enables the lawfare attacks. Uh, and, and for the Israeli government to stop supporting the lawfare and disinformation, disinformation groups, uh, the DOJ, Secretary of State and the courts also can take steps to limit the abuse of the legal system that these cases represent. There are also recommendations for civil society. Uh, the philanthropic sector increases support for organizations that work in Palestine uh, and advocate for Palestinian rights so that they can continue their work. Uh, donors, particularly government foreign assistance programs, uh, to also not be intimidated into uh, cutting funding or conducting uh, unnecessary investigations based on disinformation. These donors have very rigorous due diligence procedures that they should have confidence in their findings and in their relationships with the groups they work with. And for publishers, finally, to uh, not provide a platform for further dissemination of disinformation um, that can be submitted by bogus authors, authors or by uh, full think tanks that uh, and full research groups that uh, don't back up their information. And so publishers need to uh, give some scrutiny to these, mat these materials. Um, I would close there and happy to take any questions. I'd just like to, to say, it, after doing all this research, and, and talking to the groups and seeing the conditions that uh, and challenges that they have on the ground, saying that civil society organizations that work in Palestine, whether they're providing aid, defending human rights or assisting development projects, they are dedicated to their missions and operate under very difficult conditions. The same can be said for organizations in the United States and Europe that work to support Palestinian rights. 
They are crucial to the welfare of Palestinians and supporting human rights uh, concepts and principles globally, and that has made them targets of politically motivated attacks and is our, our responsibility as civil society to support them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay. I appreciate the walkthrough. And um, for those of you who have not accessed the report, um, perhaps we can share the link. Uh, my colleague Gabe is running things behind the scenes, but we will make sure to provide everyone with that. Um, I know there are already a few questions coming in. I'm going to um, be curating those and we will have ample time at the end of the other presentations. But at this point, I would like to introduce and hand things off to Jeff Buchholz, who will dig a little deeper into his experience serving as an attorney and litigating some of the False Claims Act suits. Uh, Jeff, please take it away. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Thanks to everybody. Um, so again, I, as a, my perspective here is that I've been outside counsel, uh, privileged to represent some charities in False Claims Act cases brought uh, that are discussed in this report. Um, and um, before that, at the Department of Justice, I was responsible for, among other things, supervising the False Claims Act uh, investigations and litigation docket. So hopefully I have uh, some helpful insights that I can share from being on both sides of the table uh, in False Claims Act matters here. Um, the False Claims Act is a complicated uh, and difficult subject that you know you could spend hours talking about. I'll try to spend about four minutes um, mentioning a few highlights uh, that are important to understand, especially for people who aren't lawyers, maybe aren't based in the U.S. and aren't familiar with the U.S. legal system generally. Uh, the False Claims Act is a very strange statute uh, in that it permits anyone, uh, for that matter, even registered foreign agents. Uh, to file suit in U.S. courts on behalf of the U.S. government. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the Federal False Claims Act, but um, pretty much every state has its own state-level version of the False Claims Act uh, as well, and usually they're, they're pretty similar to the federal version. So anyone, um, for whatever reason, uh, can file what's known as a key TAM action, that's just Latin for on behalf of the government. Uh, and um, then by statute, the government has an obligation to investigate. Um, so there are lots of things that the government on its own might not choose to devote resources to investigate. Uh, you know, Kay has talked about the uh, broad and vague nature of, for example, the material support prohibition. The government, left to its own devices, might choose to focus its resources on cases that are not close to the blurry line there, but that are you know, more righteous cases involving um, things that people would uh, more generally recognize as material support to terrorism. But when someone brings a False Claims Act case alleging that a charity told USAID that it had not provided material support to terrorist groups and that it in fact had done so, making its certification false, the government has an obligation to investigate. So one of the things I want to stress is, uh, you know, some of, of, of you on this call might think that these cases uh, brought by, by TZAC and, and others are, uh, are not proper cases. Um, but what I want to stress is that legally they could be quite serious because the government does have an obligation once one of these cases is brought to investigate. The investigation itself uh, can impose serious costs on charities. And um, the investigation has to be taken very seriously because it's the government doing the investigation. And so there's all sorts of, uh, you know, of legal and reputational risks uh, and funding risks in dealing with the government. So um, that's, that's one thing uh, to say. Uh, on the other hand, um, because the government is the, uh, you know, the real party in interest in these cases brought on its behalf, it has the authority to dismiss them and say, you know, we don't want this, this uh, private entity to be able to litigate this case involving these issues on our behalf. The government in the normal uh, world of false claims act cases involving you know, defense contracting or healthcare reimbursement or things like that usually lets the person who brings the case go forward, even if the government decides not to pursue the case itself. But um, my perspective from both being at DOJ and um, being privileged to represent the Carter Center uh, and New Israel Fund and Oxfam in these cases um, is that the government has its own institutional interests. It wants to control the development of the law about material support to terrorism. It wants to control the development of the law uh, about what the certification to USAID means. USAID has its own interests there. Um, and when someone uh, like TZAC or any other um, plaintiff who brings these cases 
uh, you know, brings these cases involving these sensitive issues, the government might say to itself, we don't really want to get drawn into this. We don't really want the court to make law on these issues in this sensitive context in a case that we didn't choose, that we didn't bring. Uh, and so the government might dismiss those cases to prevent the development of bad law, to prevent the government from being dragged into discovery about what the agency knew, whether the government really thought that it was material support or not, whether the agency was really defrauded of grant funds, et cetera. So um, for those reasons, the government has been willing to dismiss some of these cases. Uh, and I think that's an issue uh, you know, that I, I want to, the last point I want to make is that transcends uh, U.S. presidential administrations. It's really an institutional perspective that the government has. The government thinks that it's the government's prerogative to decide what's material support to terrorism and what isn't. It's its own prerogative to decide when it's been defrauded or hasn't been. Um, and when someone brings a case, the government would prefer, you know, under the circumstances of that case, not to litigate. Uh, I think whether the administration is uh, on a policy level friendly to the charity or more friendly, perhaps, to uh, the group bringing the case, that may not matter as much as just the institutional perspective of the government that it's uh, it should be the one to decide these issues. Um, the last thing I'll say is, um, as Kay alluded to, fighting back really does make a difference. These cases can be legally serious. The material support prohibition is broad and vague, and um, the tax exemption standard for electioneering that Kay alluded to is also uh, not very clear. Uh, it's a you know it when you see it kind of issue. So there is real legal risk in some of these cases. They need to be taken seriously. Uh, and <clears throat> on my perspective, it's, you know, I'm biased, of course, being outside counsel, having defended these cases, but I think it really does make a difference when the government understands, and maybe when the relator, the person bringing this case on the government's behalf, understands that the defendant is prepared to fight. Uh, that can have a, an effect on, on the outcome and can protect the charity's interests uh, going forward. Um, in the interest of time, let me leave it there. Uh, and turn it back over to Paul. I'm happy to answer questions later. Thanks. Jeff, thank you so much for that. Um, and as I said before, the Q&A function is where you can uh, enter your questions. Some we're able to respond to in the moment if they're just factual. Others, as I said, we're curating for the Q&A session toward the end. At this point, I would like to introduce, uh, reintroduce Ahmed Abuzniad uh, from the U.S. Center for Palestinian Rights. He's going to speak to us about the Anti-Terrorism Act and other of the tools uh, and laws on the books that can be, can be used or misused in these attacks. Ahmed, please. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you, Kay and Jeff, uh, for your presentations as well. Uh, I'll first start off by giving a brief background uh, for the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. This is actually our 20th year. Um, activists from across the U.S. gathered 20 years ago um, to talk about the Israeli occupation, to talk about the injustices um, that the Palestinian people have been uh, facing for decades. And, and they declared, you know, at that meeting, a purpose for folks based in the U.S. Uh, to make sure that our tax dollars, our diplomatic support, our weaponry were no longer being used uh, in the human rights abuses of the Palestinian people. So I, I want to note that because I think that we're in a special moment today, 20 years later, um, with regards to the discussion around Palestine. Um, that's changed everywhere from uh, campuses across the US to even uh, US Congress. And while we're nowhere near our, our goal, our stated goal as an organization is to end the military funding uh, to the state of Israel from the United States, we're nowhere near that goal. I think we're chipping away and we're in an interesting moment for advocates for justice um, for several issues. Um, interesting also to note, Kay, I noticed in your report that you mentioned Zakor Legal Institute um, in your presentation, and I, I wanted to mention that even prior to my experience with the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, myself and the Dream Defenders, uh, the organization that I had co-founded in, in Florida in response to the murder of Trayvon, both of us were named in a, a submission by Zakor Legal Institute um, to the U.S. government um, to, to allege some sort of uh, violations and hope for, for investigation. Also to note right around that same time, because we're, we're talking about political objectives here, this was right around the same time as the Florida go, go, uh, governor's race where Ron DeSantis defeated Andrew Gillum in a very, very close race. Dream Defenders at the time had endorsed to our C4, uh, Andrew Gillum, and there began to be not only the Zakora Legal Institute submission, but articles 
um, you know, obviously misinformation, but articles alleging uh, terrorism, alleging uh, Andrew Gillum's ties to terrorism, and alleging that I was a member of the PFLP. Um, so we clearly see that there's a political objective here um, from that example, but also right now we'll talk a little bit more about U.S. campaign. So the U.S. campaign uh, faced a lawsuit by the Jewish National Fund, and the uh, impetus uh, for the lawsuit was essentially that through social media, the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights um, amplified and offered support of the Great March of Return. Uh, for those unaware, the people of Gaza are actually refugees from historic Palestine that have a illegal and inhumane and vicious blockade surrounding them. Um, courtesy of the Israeli government. So the Great March of Return was this beautiful moment where these, these refugees uh, situated in Gaza wanted to return to their home. And so they started protesting by marching to the borders. And that's why they called it the Great March of Return. And we, of course, support Palestinians' right to protest this devastating blockade. So we shared that support online. Also, a few years prior to the Great March of Return, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights had served as a fiscal sponsor for the BNC. The BNC is the BDS National Committee. BDS stands for Boy uh, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. And this is a, um, a, a movement born out of uh, really the spirit of the movement to end South African apartheid. So we recognize how powerful international boycotts were um, in supporting the South, South African people's uh, resistance to apartheid there. And the BNC was formed uh, to, to evoke a similar campaign internationally to support Palestinians. Now, the actual BNC, that committee is made up of uh, several Palestinian organizations and several trade unions. I'll list a couple of them here. Um, the, the Palestinian National Institute for NGOs, the Federal Federation of Independent Trade Unions, um, General Union of Palestinian Teachers, General Union of Palestinian Workers, the Council of National and Islamic Forces in Palestine. And so over 170 groups in 2005 made this call. And within those body of groups, one of those groups is Hamas. And so um, basically uh, coming full circle, uh, the JNF was alleging that we provided material support to terrorism because we supported this march, um, because we had served as a fiscal sponsor. Um, and of course, there was no um, uh, meat to this argument. There was, there was no meat on the bones of this argument. Really, it was, again, a politically motivated argument, um, you know, attempted to stifle conversation, debate, and advocacy around Palestine. Thankfully, the courts viewed it as such. Uh, so Judge Richard Leon of the U.S. District Court for D.C. dismissed the lawsuit, and he characterized the plaintiff's argument as, to say the least, not persuasive. You got to love that as an attorney, um, as an advocate, you got to love when the judge issues um, such an opinion. Um, this opinion is available on the Center for Constitutional Rights website. I want to lift up their outstanding legal work on our behalf. Uh, we were really fortunate to have their support. The judge also denied a motion for reconsideration. Now, of course, uh, the, the plaintiffs will be appealing. And so we will, um, you know, be monitoring that and, and respond accordingly. But I'll just end by saying that, you know, in law school, one of my professors taught us about the legal strategy of throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. And that's truly what we're seeing here is that, you know, they're, they're throwing everything in the wall, uh, at the wall and seeing what sticks. We've seen the most recent example with the Israeli government now labeling six Palestinian human rights defending NGOs as terrorist organizations. And we see that in the same spirit of throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. I'll end by just saying that we are undeterred. We are motivated. We feel like we are, again, shifting the conversation and closer to a day where uh, the U.S. will be a supporter of Palestinian human rights um, and no longer a supporter um, of Israeli aggression and settlement activity. Uh, thank you. I'll pass it back to you now, Paul. Uh, thank you very much for that. Much appreciated. Um, our last speaker is Howard Horowitz from Westpac, and he's going to speak to us about his experiences and his organization's experiences being the target of of some of these types of attacks. Uh, just a quick housekeeping note. Um, I think uh, we, by design, added a 15 extra minutes onto this webinar. We're going through 8.15 Pacific, 11.15 Eastern time. So we still are in good shape to handle questions. We've had a number of them come in. And as I said, we will be curating these 
and uh, appreciate the interest. We're, we're going to endeavor to get to all of them. Uh, and so without further ado, let me hand it over to Howard. Thank you, Paul, and my uh, fellow panelists, and for everyone uh, listening. Um, and uh, certainly the work of Kay and um, the Charity Trust is uh, absolutely appreciated by organizations such as ourselves that often feel defenseless and alone in these kind of attacks. Um, our case is about using the weapon of denying our, trying to deny our charitable status uh, with the IRS. Um, my pre short presentation of that follows directly from Ahmad's case and uh, USCPR. Uh, it's the same uh, as Kay pointed out in the report. It is the attempt to equate uh, criticism of the state and government of Israel with um, anti-Semitism. Uh, for us, even if I don't get my few minutes to the details of our case, uh, better to talk about the issue. For us, uh, working in Westchester County, New York, with its vibrant, alive, progressive, liberal Jewish community, a very important audience for us. I, I am part of that uh, community. And for us to be able to connect in solidarity with all forms of racial, economic and social and political injustice, of which for many of our members, myself included, Israeli government's treatment of Palestinians uh, in uh, the territory that they occupy in uh, pre-1948 in uh, Palestine um, as a whole is problematic, needs to be criticized, needs to be brought to the attention of our community. For me, particularly the Jewish community. We see this um, as a direct attempt to break the link of solidarity from the racial and economic justice movements here in the US that we connect to the situation in Israel-Palestine. And this uh, letter to the IRS requesting or demanding the revocation of our status was uh, 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 filed in the spring of 2020. It is a classic case of what Kay pointed out of the drift towards authoritarianism and uh, legal statutes about uh, terrorism, in this case, anti-Semitism, being uh, exploited for political ends. In this case, it's about uh, uh, Donald Trump's executive order that um, anti-Semitism on campus be subject to Title VI uh, law enforcement, uh, which is about racial discrimination on a campus, and then uh, set in, and the criteria should be the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which Kay pointed out in her report, is enabling, that was in 2019, so in 2020, we get this letter to the IRS. It's taking advantage of these uh, laws that are setting up uh, these defenses that we have to take. We do not want to be put into a position of having to defend against anti-Semitism. Our agenda is to talk about our uh, agenda. And let me share with you, uh, and I'll close with this. Let me share with you what that is and why it's so problematic that uh, we are uh, that anti-Semitism is being weaponized against our efforts. Here is what uh, we are about. Westpac Foundation provides outreach and community to individuals, groups, and leaders in civic and religious organizations in greater Westchester. Groups who find themselves without a voice or a support system for their progressive positions. Westpac Foundation's purpose is to give a human face to those who would otherwise be unrecognized victims of war and justice and environmental degradation. Our members are currently involved with criminal justice, reform and police accountability, food justice, fair housing, climate justice, safe renewable energy, immigrant protection, solidarity with indigenous peoples, an end to militarism and drone warfare, and the struggle for justice and equal rights and human dignity for all the inhabitants of Israel, Palestine. We think that connecting that struggle 
with all these struggles in the United States is why we are being attacked. These, these issues are core to the Jewish community here in Westchester, and it's an attempt to, uh, to accuse us of what is a blood libel of anti-Semitism. What the Jews have been victim of throughout the century is being foisted upon us, a blood libel of anti-Semitism using these uh, laws and executive orders that have created this situation where these lawfare attacks can take place. Thank you. Howard, thank you very much. I, I wanna extend a thanks to, to Jeff, Ahmad and you as well um, for joining us today. Uh, there are a number of questions, as I said, I'm going to do my utmost best because I know how important these issues are. Um, as you can imagine, some of the questions are specific legal questions and some are more about the broader context of lawfare. Uh, there are several that are related, so I'm, I'm going to jump right in. And most of them, I think, are to everyone, although there is one or two that are specific to a panelist. Um, the first couple of questions are actually kind of near and dear to my heart because uh, as a non-attorney myself, one of my first questions was, what about the opposite? Can, can we go on the offensive? So there were a couple of questions related to, can we go on the offensive against or these uh, the sources of these attacks or these attacks? And or can attorneys who who file these suits or bring these claims that are that are baseless, is there any type of penalty they pay? And anyone you know can jump in. So I can take a first crack at, at this to the extent it's a question about law as opposed to policy. I mean, my perspective here as outside counsel to some charities that have been sued here is really narrowly focused on the on the law and defense of those cases as opposed to, as Paul put it, some of the broader policy issues that uh, are being discussed here. Um, U.S. legal system, unlike a lot of other legal systems, uh, really encourages access to courts and um, does not impose costs and, and attorney's fees on unsuccessful plaintiffs in general. Um, there are provisions that uh, can, can result in, in costs and attorney's fees being imposed on unsuccessful plaintiffs in extraordinary circumstances, including the False Claims Act has its own uh, statutory provision that, that addresses this, but really the, the bar is very, very high uh, to make the unsuccessful plaintiff pay the defendant's legal fees. So, you know, Congress could change that, I guess, but, but that's been the way our legal system has worked, uh, you know, throughout our lifetimes and, and beyond. And, and it's, in my view, unlikely that that's going to change in a significant way. So in an extreme case, uh, that's certainly something that a defendant should consider. But as a broad, uh, on, the, on, the, on a broad level, as a practical matter, that's unlikely to be uh, you know, a big part of, of any, um, you know, practical solution uh, for charities uh, in this area. Um, and, you know, um, as Kay said, it takes $400 you know, to file a case in federal court. Um, if the case goes forward into discovery, that can impose costs on the, on the plaintiff. But because of the nature of these false claims act cases, most of the discovery would not even involve the plaintiff. And so the reality is it's very cheap. Uh, to file these false claims act cases, hope the government investigates and decides to pursue, in which case the person filing the case gets a share of the recovery without really having to do much work. Um, false claims act is a very strange statute, as I said before, in providing for this mechanism for you know random private citizens to sue on behalf of the government. But the act has existed for a very long time. Uh, Congress has expanded it, including that mechanism for private actions on behalf of the government. Uh, numerous times over the years, and it, you know, in my view, as a as a lawyer in this space, it's unlikely that that's going to change anytime soon. Um, and the last thing I'll say is just, you know, in response to your question, uh, Paul, uh, that someone raised about, you know, whether uh, whether charities uh, who have been targeted by these kinds of cases could uh, go on the offense and and bring these kinds of cases against uh, people on the other side as a policy matter. I mean, you know, as I've said, the U.S. legal system makes it pretty easy to get into court as a plaintiff, um, pretty low risk and low cost uh, to bring these kinds of cases. I'm not advocating that. And what I said before about the U.S. government's uh, DOJ in particular, their perspective on these cases is I don't think that's really dependent on whether the plaintiff bringing the false claims act case is, uh, you know, coming from one particular side of the political spectrum and the, and the defendant is from the opposite side or, or that were flipped and the shoe were on the other foot. I, I think the 
the institutional perspective of the government is the government should get to decide when to pursue issues about material support and terrorism or the like, and whether that sort of issue was being litigated by uh, you know, a, a, a right-wing group or a progressive group against you know, vice versa, I don't think that really would change the government's perspective on it. So you know, um, I think the government's view is you know, sort of two wrongs don't make a right. And so if you, if you think that these cases are improper because it's not the right vehicle to litigate these sensitive issues, you know, that would suggest that going on the offense and bringing similar cases would not be uh, a great move. Um, but uh, you know, that's a policy question that's out of my lane. All right. Well, I, let, let me thank you, Jeff, for that. And let, let me um, pivot a bit because one of the other questions, um, not to pit you and Ahmad <laughs> against one another, but it was an interesting question. Uh, coming from a civil society perspective, the question was, um, you know, which law would you say presents the larger burden or, or is more ominous for civil society, the False Claims Act or the Anti-Terrorism Act? And I think there's probably not a straight answer to that, but it, it's an interesting discussion question. And then something related to that, um, which Jeff, maybe you can drill down a bit more on, which is what criteria does the Department of Justice use when it decides to dismiss a case? In other words, if you're the target of a False Claims Act suit, what as a civil society or an NGO would, would you say is important to focus on in terms of documentation or understanding how DOJ makes those decisions? Um, and you know, Howard also, I think uh, you know, anyone can respond, but I'd love to hear what you think about ATA versus FCA, <laughs> or if there are two heads of the same beast. Yeah, I'll try to answer briefly and then um, let Ahmad jump in. I, I, I think it would be difficult to say which one is uh, you know, more dangerous or a more potent weapon. Um, they're both pretty dangerous, uh, pretty potent weapons. They cover different things. Um, you know, the False Claims Act would come into play only uh, if, if, a, if the defendant, if the charity has gotten money from the U.S. government, um, USAID or some other U.S. government funder, um, and that, that's the hook. It's the alleged fraud against the U.S. government. That's the basis for a False Claims Act suit. Um, the Anti-Terrorism Act isn't about fraud against the U.S. government. So it's just a, it's hard to say which one is you know, as a more potent weapon, they're, they're different, they're potent in their own spheres. Um, one difference that's important is the government does get to control False Claims Act cases. I mean, the government can't control who brings them on the government's behalf, but the government can largely control whether they go forward or not. Uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act, on the other hand, actually gives a private right of action uh, to people to sue, not on the government's behalf, but on their own behalf. And the government can't control that litigation the same way it can control False Claims Act litigation. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I, I won't uh, get into offering which um, is more devastating or, or problematic than the other. I'll just, in, in alluding to the previous question, um, the, the U.S. campaign is absolutely interested in figuring out how to go on the offensive. Um, and so perhaps there's some conversations to be had from folks on this, um, you know, this panel and, and several groups across the U.S. But we also want to go beyond just countersuits. Um, you know, I think like we don't want to be limited in that perspective of what going on the offensive could be. Um, and, and if we did have those plans, I obviously wouldn't share them on this public forum. Um, but we are absolutely interested in figuring out, you know, how does our organizing and advocacy incorporate um, a framework or a model or a campaign um, that can go on the offensive against these, these sorts of attacks. And, and last thing I'll say on that point is, you know, certainly one of the objectives of these attacks is to um, get us off um, of, of our goal, um, off of our direction. And so we have to, as advocates uh, for Palestinian rights, maintain that our ultimate um, guiding point, our ultimate um, lighthouse, if you will, needs to continue to be ending all military aid to the state of Israel. And so we don't need to get caught up too much um, in some of the noise that's on the, the side. We need to make sure that we're able to um, carve out our pathway uh, and reach our destination. Uh, I, would, I, would like, I would just like to uh, add to that in terms of, of going on the offensive legally is that the, the groups that are, are doing this work or that have been attacked, um, they have a mission that's not related to the courts or um, they, 
or to going after their uh, people who disagree with them politically. Their missions are to provide humanitarian assistance, to uh, help provide education to, uh, to people uh, in vocational education or, or to children of school age, um, and, and to engage in human rights uh, defense and conflict resolution. Those are their priorities and that's where they put their time and attention. Mm. I, I wanna sort of jump in and, uh, and maybe raise up uh, this uh, cabal of anti-Semitism to the level of false claims and uh, anti-terrorism. Um, and related to the question of going on the offense, I wouldn't, uh, I, would, I would call it more a prevent defense than an offense. Uh, meaning to pay attention to local, regional, state politics. Right now, we are engaged currently in conversations, difficult ones, with local villages uh, responding to AJC's uh, mayor's campaign to have IHRA written into local law in a local town and uh, in two local town, local municipalities here in Westchester. Uh, a group of us informally, not representing Westpac, but several individuals, um, uh, most of whom happen to be Jewish because we're so concerned about the mixing up of anti-Semitism with uh, Israel government uh, policies. And we've stepped in and communicated with these committees at these local and said, wait, do you realize the implications of IHRA and its focus, main focus on Israel, not on anti-Semitism? And they said, no, we, we didn't know. We, we, we just thought it was, of course, we're against anti-Semitism, aren't you? And we stepped in and said, we're, we're all for a resolution about anti-Semitism as a, as a form of all racism. And we want to work with you to get one that's acceptable and doesn't weapponize the um, Israel-Palestine uh, um, issue. And uh, we've made a lot, of, we've got a lot of traction. Actually, the, these both proceedings got halted. For, so we can present our case and present our alternative resolution. So that's my recommendation about going on an offense and watching out locally in your communities for uh, what's happening. By the way, the same thing happened with BDS. All of a sudden, Westchester County um, led Board of Legislators had an anti-BDS resolution. And uh, when we approached them about human rights in Palestine, they say, Mr. Horowitz, what are you talking to us for? We do golf courses and sewers. We don't do um, foreign policy, but uh, others got this on the agenda. So we responded and we got a chance to talk about our agenda. And in that case, we were semi-successful. They, they changed the resolution from uh, unconstitutional legal prohibition on supporting BDS to a sense of the board that they think BDS is not a good thing. So. Uh, so that's my suggestion for going on the offense. Right. Thank you, Howard, and thanks everyone. I, actually, Howard, that's a very interesting segue because we had a question, and I'm going to try to frame this the right way, but also make mention of the fact that another aspect of, of lawfare, which is particularly, I think, unique, is something called deplatforming. We talked about financial issues, bank de-risking and so on, but deplatforming refers to as we're all familiar with social media platforms, whether it's Twitter or Facebook, or more importantly, financial services like PayPal and Venmo and so on. And um, one aspect of, of the lawfare sort of ecosystem and miss or in some cases disinformation goes right to the heart of how organizations transact financial transactions. And so the, the question we had from the audience but I wanna also um, turn to Kay because we do some work with some partners on deplatforming. It says, do, do lawfare groups connect with or coordinate with other organizations, for example, Anti-Defamation League, American Jewish Congress, so on, that may seem less quote unquote conservative. I, I realize this is, a, you know, the, the entire conversation is sensitive, but I think when it comes to enabling or promoting or supporting what may be broadly seen as, as lawfare and maybe not a legal attack, but a reputational or a financial attack. Um, curious to get maybe legal perspective on this, Howard Kay, um, sort of ecosystem um, perspective on this. Well, I'll, I'll just throw in quickly. Uh, I don't know about if it's related to deplatforming. You mentioned uh, the ADL. Westpac was a subject in an ADL report about, uh, about uh, 
uh, funding or promoting anti-Zionism on uh, campus. So I don't know about any connection between any of these uh, groups, but uh, the ADL has, with a small organization like us, we have a total, we were operate on a $300,000 a budget, most of which goes to the salary for a director and rent. Um, and uh, we are the focus of this intense uh, scrutiny. We, we sort of feel proud in one sense that we're, we must be effective way beyond uh, what we're, what we think we are. Uh, but, uh, but in any case, we do, we do see these attacks coming from different kinds of sources, even the uh, ones that are not connected to lawfare per se, but are uh, that um, working on, in this case, uh, an organization devoted to uh, anti-Semitism that now seems to be, uh, seems to be uh, taking evidence of uh, uh, right-wing uh, fundamentalist anti-Semitism, um, noticing that and then turning it against uh, progressive organizations. Um, uh, as far as accusing them of anti-Semitism. So that's what's going on in that sphere. And I'll add that what we, we've seen is that the Zionist Advocacy Center and some others have uh, had a campaign to put pressure on uh, online donations to service providers that, that provide these platforms for groups to raise money online and on their websites. Um, which for many can be a key source of, of revenue. And uh, the Science Advocacy Center has sent uh, basically threatening letters to some of these financial services providers saying, do you know you have this customer, uh, Charity X, uh, who is providing material support to terrorism and by, by providing them with financial services, you are providing material support to terrorism and we are copying the Department of Justice uh, in this letter and informing you of this fact and telling you you should drop them as a customer. And for some financial service providers, that's all it takes. Their risk tolerance level is very low. It's basically cheaper for them to drop the customer than it is to pay uh, a lawyer for an hour or two of due diligence to find out if there's any merit to this claim. Uh, so that that's a another form of attacks on funding that we mentioned in the report. We've also seen um, that I don't know about the relationships between all the various organizations in the US that wasn't part of our research, but uh, since the report uh, was finalized, the ADL and PayPal have entered a partnership of where uh, PayPal will work with ADL Center on Extremism and all this it's a double-edged sword because it appears to be uh, in many ways targeted to uh, against uh, white supremacists, but at the same time, these same tools and same approaches can be used to go after those that support Palestinian rights and human rights defenders. Uh, so it's, it's a very problematic and unsettled area. And deplatforming on a larger scale, we could look to uh, what's happening on university college campuses constant attempt to de-platform completely um, uh, those who are critical of the policies of the government of the state of Israel. Uh, that is an even more huge issue, I think, than these pay platforms. Right. Thank, thank you both for that. Um, I'm cognizant of time. We're at about 10 minutes past the hour. And what I would like to do at this point, and I apologize, there were several other questions that I'll maybe sort of highlight here. Um, but what I wanted to do is ask a sort of a closing question to all of you, if you would, would respond to. Um, and we've had questions ranging from, you know, what other types of partnerships or, or support networks might there be? And, and ultimately, might there be even some congressional implicit support of some kind to um, question to Ahmad about the success that, that CPR has had in, in defending or supporting uh, organizations in Palestine? But what I'd like to do is sort of pull this back and ask, you know, where do you see all of this headed? We, we, we began this conversation talking about how this is, um, so the report is confined to the Israeli-Palestinian context, but really the threats are fundamental to civil society and could be replicated. And, and we begin to see evidence that that could happen elsewhere. Where is it all headed? And are there suggestions or recommendations beyond what was called out in the report to of, of what to do? And, and so far, I know that the answers have been 
it's it's it's, it's not a rosy outlook. Um, and it seems like solidarity is is one thing, and not being afraid to push back is another. But I'm just curious to get your your barometer of where all this is headed. And I would urge those of you who, who ask questions that we weren't able to get to, please contact us um, offline and, and would just love to hear your responses and then I will close things out. Well, so I'll try to answer that briefly. Um, I think where this is headed in the narrow, at least sense that I can address about uh, litigation is there's gonna be more of it. Uh, the barriers to bringing suit are low, cost of doing so are, are low, uh, potential rewards for, for people who are motivated to do this are high, but there's going to be more False Claims Act litigation. There's probably going to be more ATA litigation. Um, and, you know, to briefly tie that into a question that was asked earlier that I didn't have a chance to answer the criteria that DOJ uses in deciding what to do. The most important factor is the merits, right? So, yes, the material support prohibition is broad, and you know, I'm not here to talk about policy issues about whether it should be as broad as it is or isn't, but it, it is what it is. And now that these cases have been brought, um, everyone is sensitized in the charity community to the risk of false claims act cases being brought, to the need to pay attention to exactly what you're certifying to USAID or other funders. And the most important factor that DOJ will, will take into account is the merits of these cases. If you're close to the line, uh, potentially close to the line on material support, you have more to be afraid of than if you're not close to the line. So um, there's going to be more litigation. There's going to be a continuing need. Uh, unfortunately, for charities to devote resources to defending these kinds of cases and to, uh, you know, having compliance programs that try to make sure they don't get close to those lines, uh, as blurry as they are. And uh, I, I, would, I would say on the technical level, uh, what we have learned over the years, and I'm sure it's the case for everybody, is to be uh, meticulous in your financial records, in your communication with your, um, with uh, those you uh, are uh, a support or a funding organization or that use your 501c3, make sure it's relevant uh, to your broad, broad or local work and to uh, make sure all of your uh, documents are in order for the IRS if they pursue this so that it's resolved uh, quickly and without a lot of cost and that you're clearly doing a good job as a 501c3 organization, it's very, very, uh, very important. And I already said, I won't dwell on it, that uh, I think your agenda is your best counter weapon. And that uh, let it be known that if you're attacked in this way, you will use it as an occasion to speak about the issue when, as I pointed out with the Westchester County Legislature, you don't often get a chance to sit in a public forum and talk about Palestine. They won't put it on the agenda. So let it be known to these attackers that you will, uh, you will fight them with the righteousness of your cause and your agenda uh, beyond uh, the legal realm. And uh, that would be my, my advice. So um, I'll, I'll first attempt to answer the question about how we supported the orgs. Um, you know, we were able to work with partners like JVP to um, use, utilize an action tool that had thousands of people calling the White House, thousands of people submitting letters uh, to Sec Secretary Antony Blinken. Um, so we feel like uh, we had, you know, folks that are within our network, folks that are engaged in the issue, uh, speak up um, and make sure that it was on record that we opposed this designation by the Israeli government. Um, on these six Palestinian organizations. Now, in, in general, where is this headed? Um, you know, my, my colleagues here talked a bit about where is this headed um, from a legal standpoint, but again, I'll, I'll answer in a more general um, fashion. We're in a new moment as it relates to Israel and Palestine. The conversations that are happening today would not have been happening 10, 20, 30 years ago, even in the halls of Congress. So where is this headed? This, uh, my friends, my colleagues, this is headed to a free Palestine. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today, and I look forward to celebrating with you all on that day. Well said. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll close with in terms of where this is this headed. Uh, our concern is that this not only continues to be a problem for organizations that work in Palestine or support Palestinian rights, but that 
it, it spread to other areas. So civil society, including Charity Security Network, will continue to build a solidarity with groups to provide resources for groups that are attacked to make sure that none are in the position the Norwegian People's Aid was in and felt forced to settle because it, it felt isolated and didn't have um, the resources to defend itself. So uh, we will continue to build the infrastructure uh, to defend against these legal cases and to make it uh, more difficult for the lawfare attack, attack groups to succeed and make uh, it require expenditure of more resources on their part. Um, I think we'll also have to keep a close eye on the Anti-Terrorism Act. There are some cases um, in the US courts that with various interpretations of what this aiding and abetting uh, standard might mean and how many degrees of association are, are necessary uh, to establish liability that could, uh, there's one case that may go to the Supreme Court uh, in the next term. And so those are uh, things to keep a close eye on. Um, we haven't seen as many announcements from the Zionist Advocacy Center of filing of false claims act cases as, as we did around the period of 2018, 2019. I don't know if that means uh, they've gone under, new cases are under seal and, and uh, the attorney just isn't announcing them. Uh, but uh, I think we are seeing that the, the position of the DOJ in not allowing the legal process to be politicized and weaponized uh, in the way it was in the Carter, uh, in the Carter Center case and Oxfam case where DOJ moved to dismiss is very significant and may discourage uh, future, some future false claiming cases. That said, uh, we will, uh, the sector will just have to continue to be vigilant and work closely together and make sure that this, these attacks don't distract us from our primary missions, which is supporting human rights, providing humanitarian assistance, uh, education, development, and decent living conditions for people, and ending violent conflict. And uh, as Howard said, that's the mission and that's the first line of defense and what we need to focus on. Thank you, Kay. And, and in closing, I have, I have two thanks and an apology. First of all, I wanna thank our, our panelists and for the hard work they do and for their expert support. And I wanna thank the audience. I wanna thank your participation, your attention over this last hour and 20 minutes and for your questions. The apology of course is I wasn't able to get to all of the questions, um, but we are here. The Charity and Security Network is here. Our members and colleagues, um, obviously there, there's expertise beyond just our staff in terms of, of lawfare, both legal and, and sort of policy. And at the end of the day, um, our, our mission is to focus on protecting and defending the legitimate rights of civil society, not only in this context, but, but worldwide. So for those of you that have not seen the report or need a link, please just visit our website or, or email us. Um, the other thing I will say is I, I believe my, my view of this report, it is, has a long shelf life. This is not the kind of typical Washington report that is relevant to a very quick context. This provides, uh, I think, a very valuable basis of information and analysis that will serve communities and organizations well for some time. So thank you for your attendance, for your attention, and please everyone have a safe and, and good day and holiday period ahead. <laughs>